Well, all right, Brett, how is it going? How are you? You know what? I, every time someone says, how are you? I always say that's a big question during COVID <laughs> times, but uh, I'll give you an easy answer. It's it, it's good. I went to the gym this morning, so it's a mm. good morning that I had a chance to get out and actually do something. Yeah, that's good. I, oh, this is, I'm already diving into things probably too early, but uh, I listened to your talk on this specifically on YouTube during COVID. And that was one thing for me that I like kind of realized was I was, I was sitting on my couch doing nothing and eating pizza every day because everyone was super depressed. Um, is it was just like, yeah, the small things of, I don't know why I went on this rabbit trail, but yeah, the small things where you encouraged me during COVID to start like working out and thinking more about mm. my mental health is more than just, uh, in my head, but it's actually something that's also in the way that I live my life. So I would, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for that. Cause that was huge for me during COVID where I've recently started eating a lot healthier and trying to work out. I don't do it every day, but I tried to, and it's like, oh, my mental health is significantly better. Then when I was midsummer, just sitting around eating pizza every day, just feeling so just sitting on the couch watching TV. So no, thank you for that. That was great. Um, you and I met, well, actually I ran into you at Youthquake. Um, the same, I think Mark Clark was also speaking that year and it was like the super cold year that was insane. Um, and you were, you did two talks. You did one on culture which uh, I remember being super impactful for me. And I was like, wow, because I think I just went to it because it sounded interesting. Like I was in grade 11. So I wasn't like, oh, I really want to learn about culture. But I was like, I don't know. Let's see what this guy says in critiquing the stuff that I mean, it was, it was really thoughtful. And then you did one on sex too, uh, which is funny. I remember as a teenager, I was like nervous to go to it. I was like, what are people going to think of me going to this conference? And then it's like, it was the gym was packed and it was, yeah, they were so good. And I, I remember like being like, wow, this guy is so good at speaking and has just a ton of knowledge. College, and I couldn't find you for some reason I just couldn't remember who you were or your name and then one time in listening to the village church podcast um, from the sermons at uh, the church in uh, Langley BC with Mark uh, you spoke there and you did the same talk and I was like oh there he is and I was like oh now I know who he is and then I totally forgot again and I was like I can't remember and I can't find it because it's buried under all the sermons um, and then finally, recently, I think it was last year, which is crazy to think about that we were at a conference together. Last, I, that just seems unreal and, and not like it was even possible. But we were at a conference last February, I think, um, and or maybe it was January. But you were there and you spoke and we were sitting at a table and uh, I, I was just chatting with you. And then I sat there and it all clicked. And I was like, I think... And I, and I asked you, I was like, did you speak at YQ? Did you speak at Village Church? Did you talk about like <laughs> Katy Perry and sex at one point? And you're like, yeah, that's me. And I was like, oh, I finally figured out who you were. So that's my connection with you of how I've ran into you. Um, but for those who don't know who you are, do you just want to give a little bit about yourself, like who you are, what you do, what you've been up to and what COVID's been like for you? It's funny you bring up Mark Clark. Um, so when I spoke at Village, I, I, I grew up with Mark and Hmm. his wife uh, we come from the same church really but uh that, that was the most exhausting day i've ever had because i think there was four i think it was four morning services an afternoon service and an evening service i did all six <laughs> like if it, i remember getting back to my hotel i was just exhausted what do they say one hour of speaking is worth eight hours of work so it was a wow. work week in one That's day crazy anyways for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Brett Allman. Uh, I come from a town called Ajax. Ajax is 45 minutes east of Toronto. Uh, my background, uh, I'm actually a teacher by trade. Uh, I was a kinesiology major in school. Never thought I'd be a teacher, but uh, went into teaching, trained for high school. I was at phys ed, chemistry, biology. Never taught that. There were no phys ed jobs. And so I went down and uh, spoke, or I, I talked in the elementary, talked, what am I saying? taught in the elementary <laughs> panel uh, for about nine years uh, in the Melbourne community of Scarborough for people from in Ontario. And then I left that, I think it's 15 years, it might be 16 mm. soon, but uh, I went into this, the idea of speaking full time, which in an American paradigm is normal, in a Canadian paradigm is not. Mm. Like the idea of speaking full time. And so I speak on issues that I think we often have just forgotten to talk about mental health, which I'm really glad we're speaking on today. I have a new talk called Parenting Navigating Everything. It's like this foundations of parenting, communication, time, discipline. Uh, I have a new one called Men Navigating Everything. I like the navigating everything. Mm. It's that 
functional holistic view of who we are and so that one's often our talks on men are just about sex and we're so much yeah. more than that we're like huh. you know men as fathers husbands you know physical health emot emotional health spiritual health and then i speak on well you mentioned my talk on sex uh i have a talk on pornography talk on dating is that it? oh and i talk on media as well but I, uh, when I left teaching, I did a program called the Arrow Leadership Program, which some people will know. Uh, mine was out in British Columbia. Then I did a master's degree of evangelism and leadership uh, in Wheaton uh, in Chicago. And I'm just about to start my master's in counseling psychology uh, coming up in May. Mm -hmm. And so uh, going back to school, a little nervous about that. I, as I'll talk about, I had a breakdown after my last master's. So a little <laughs> leery about heading into another <laughs> master's program. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, and, and yeah, I, I remember sitting, um, last year at, at the youth conference, cause you spoke to, um, the like head leaders or youth pastors first, and then you did talks throughout the conference and your first one was on the mental health piece. And I, I was thinking, cause at the time I was wrestling with, um, my own mental health journey, cause I knew that there was something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. Eventually after more and more time for a while, I thought it was maybe OCD. Um, but eventually I learned that it was actually ADHD and it came out in OCD kind of habits because my brain was figuring out that you can't function without us doing crazy things that you have to do all the time. So it was really <laughs> weird and interesting. So eventually I figured that out. But I, I remember sitting there at the during your talk and feeling just a sense of relief because it um, this topic in like for some reason in Christianity and in the church is not a often safe topic and I remember I talked to you after um, we had like a short conversation where I like thanked you for it because even that week um, before before you gave that talk I had someone tell me that like um, that I shouldn't really think about my mental health and like I just need to pray and whatever and uh, mental health stuff is just kind of the, the world lying to you and you just need to pray and read your Bible, which didn't make me feel very good because you also, it's weird because you just feel that like guilty, even though if someone were to tell me that someone told them, I'd tell them that that was nonsense. But for some reason, when it's you, it just feels like maybe they're right. And maybe I'm just like off and doing something that's really foolish. But you, of course, have your own journey, which I think is super interesting. And I think that's why you're so good at talking about this is because you've experienced it. Um, and so can you just tell us like what happened in 2012 that was a major shift for you in the way that you lived your life? Yeah, for sure. I have to be honest. I, when anyone, like when you just say someone said to you that statement, I get two different tensions. One is I just feel sad. Mm -hmm. I just feel sad that someone else has to be told something because I know how you would go home and feel after that. But the other part of me, and this is my, maybe my spiritual giftings is I get angry and I get a bit frustrated <laughs> and looking at how do we change that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I try to give people the benefit of the doubt that their goal isn't to hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't assume people have that, but yeah. these are things that we can change. And this is why I think today's an important conversation. Anyways, my journey, um, I am not someone who journeyed, struggled, use whatever term we want uh, with mental health in my life. I was a speaker on it. I spoke on, well, for many years, I spoke more on self-harm, cutting suicide, eating disorders, mm -hmm. anorexia, bulimia, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then moved into the conversation on depression and anxiety. And today we'd kind of umbrella a lot of those things together. But I left teaching, did the Arrow program, went straight into my master's program, but I was still speaking full-time. Mm -hmm. So now I'm an international student and the program was a modular one where I would fly to Chicago uh, and you know spend three days or six days. And I'm also speaking 275 to 300 speaking dates a year to pay for it. That's crazy. Which is l ludicrous, not the rapper, the word, like it's absolute <laughs> stupidity. <laughs> And I recognize that, but I recognize it in hindsight, because mm. in the moment I had to pay for flights and books and I was writing books at the time. And I, I'd be like, I remember once speaking 32 times in 14 days. Mm. It was morning. So I think I did two or three schools during the day and then an evening and it, every, and then I'd be sitting in a Tim Hortons writing papers in between my friends, my family. 
Uh, and by the way, I'm married. My wife's name is Dawn. Uh, she's a nurse and I have two kids. My daughter Zoe's in first year university. She's actually at a university called uh, Western. Some of you might know it's in London. Mm -hmm. And my son Ben is in grade 12. So I have two kids who will lose their grade 12 years. Um, but at that point, I had a pregnant wife, a one and a half year old who hadn't slept through the night. I'm speaking a, a crazy amount of, of times. And everyone, so my family, my friends, my board of directors were not for profit. People during my, you know, in my Wheaton program would sit me down and kind of like the TV show Intervention. Do you remember that? Yeah. They would have yeah. that, not like a group of people who sat me down, but one at a time. And every one of them said, um, you're doing too much. And I said, mm. I know, and I'll be okay. I just, you know, I just need to, as many of us as in leadership do, we're tough, we're strong. You know, I'm an Enneagram eight. I can do it. I will get through it. And I did. And so I graduated mm. uh, March 1st, 2012. And that was the night I stopped sleeping. Uh, and what's really funny, I say funny, it's not the right word, but I have not slept through the night since, and it's 2021. Uh, and so first began to have, um, I say issues. I don't even know the terminology you use, but I, I was speaking in a town called Woodstock, an hour and a bit from me. And I forget how, I think it was 400 students. Like it was a regional students event. We had all, all kinds of students in. And I was, I'm 6'6". Six, six, you can't tell from this, but I'm a tall guy. And so I don't usually stand on stage. I like to walk kind of across the front because people can see me. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of speaking, it was in a moment, it was like the movie Matrix. You know, when Keanu Reeves does that weird thing, I yeah. thought I was going to pass out. And at the back mm -hmm. of my mind, I remember kind of thinking, how do you gracefully pass out in front of people? Like, do I just fall over? <laughs> do I go to one knee? And I can't breathe. And I have all these feelings I've never had before. And I, I kind mm -hmm. of asked for a break and then I sat on the front place, whatever you call it, like the, you know, the top of the stage and spoke and went home the next day, went to my doctor and he said, you have anxiety. And I remember kind of arguing saying, no, 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 I speak on anxiety. He said, no, 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 you have anxiety. And it was this weird, he put me on some really simple meds and I went home mm -hmm. and this up and down happened over and over again, East coast, Halifax. I was at Camrose, Alberta, panic attacks you know, cocooning myself in hotels. And the whole thing was, I did not understand what was going on. Mm. And um, it all came to head. I was at a camp called Lake Shore. It's a Pentecostal camp, about an hour from me. Supposed to do some speaking, went boating with friends of mine. And I thought I was, I, I remember saying to my wife, like, I, I enjoyed this day. And I thought, I'm getting better. It's funny when you say things, <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> Walking out of the McDonald's, you know how you walk out of the McDonald's, there's the drive through, you have to kind of walk over to get yeah. to your car. Well, I yeah. thought I was being hit by a car, yeah. but I wasn't being hit by a car. I was actually 10 feet past the drive through and I was falling into a parked car. My equilibrium was just shot. Wow. And my wife, kind of like a blind person, grabbed my arm, walked me to my car, took me back to the cottage. I couldn't leave the cottage. I would shake every, I get two or three houses down and shake. Didn't leave the cottage for the week, didn't leave my house for five months, basically, wow. and didn't work for a year. And it's 2021. And this week I've had at least four panic attacks and wow. still haven't slept through the night. And so it's just been an interesting journey for me as someone, not only who speaks on mental health, which is probably that in my parenting and my largest things, but mm -hmm. someone who's still journeying with mental health. And so I... The, every time I speak, more and more people, especially men, though, it, it's the conversation on, so you journey with this? And it's like, yeah. And they're like, I've never told anyone. And they, they tell me the similar stories. Everyone's a little different because uh, we have different things we're journeying with. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of my background. No, and that story is, um, I don't know, it's, I can't even imagine going through that specifically where you're going, you're going. And everyone's kind of warning you, hey, this isn't going to work out well. And you're like, ah, it's fine. But then I don't think anyone would have imagined what happened with it. And even just the uh, the shift from, I don't know, like it's like the thing with church um, often and in, in Christians is the stigma behind it. And it's interesting to just talk to someone who's like, no, like I was someone who was functioning at a high rate and like doing all the things I probably shouldn't have been doing. 
And then like, it was just real where like, I couldn't leave my house for like five months. And cause I, cause I know that for me, when I was going through my own thing, like people did, and lots of people are very gracious, but there were lots of people who would say things, well, it's like, oh, it's all just in your head. And it's like, when you're stuck in your house for five months, you can't get out. And even like when you're like 10 years later and still not sleeping and um, having panic attacks, still, it's hard to say that it's just a thing that's in your, well, it is in your head, but it's not just in your head where you're making it up. And so um, what was it like for you when this started to happen? How, how did the church treat you? How did Christians treat you? How did they respond to the struggle that you were going through? Um, what's interesting is, again, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt because there may be people who listen to this and they were the mm -hmm. people who came into my house and sat on my couch. Um, but too often people became Job's friends and we could debate mm -hmm. what Job's friends did in the book of Job, but people came in and so I, I can't leave. I would go three houses down and I would shake and begin to panic. And if someone doesn't know what a panic attack is, it's like a grenade goes off in your body. So it's not just like, I feel a little off or a little tingly. It yeah. is literally like, I feel like I'm exploding. I yeah. use the term now, I say to my wife, I feel snow globed, kind of like, and I use it as a verb. So I get, you know, snow globe and you shake it. Yeah. And everything's, and I'm like, I'm, that's how I feel. Like everything's mm -hmm. just floating around. Anyways, people would come in and they would say to me what they think is the right answer mm. without the knowledge or understanding that almost everything people said was devastating to me. So the number of people would come in and say, have you tried Jesus? And I would say, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> They're like, well, you know, Jesus. And I'm like, but what do you mean by have I tried him? Like, mm. you know, it's like, I just need to take another sip of, it's like, what do you mean by that? And they would look at me and say, isn't that what I'm supposed to say to you? And I'd be like, I don't know. And then they would leave and I would sit. And then I would wonder, have I not tried Jesus enough? Mm. And because you're still unwell and you're still at home, there's a lot of blame you put on yourself. And you're, you're like, I guess I'm, I've done something like, and again, it's, this is works-based theology where we're somehow blaming yeah. the person kind of like, if you don't try Jesus enough, you then get mental health. Like, is this the theology that we have yeah. in life? And then the next person would say, have you tried running? And I would say, I haven't left the house in months. And it's not like they'd say, have you tried walking? They'd say, we should try running. And it's like, okay, running was really great for you. It, it's not really giving me the answer now. <laughs> have you tried vitamin D? Yeah, you know, it's like, but it was just a million roads in a yeah. million directions. Mm -hmm. And in all that, I just, if we live, if you've read the term, the theater of your mind, it's like there's a little theater that plays right in front, like a little movie, because it's mm -hmm. all you can see. Yeah. It's hard to see, you know, the forest through the trees. It's hard for me to see what's going on around me when my whole body is just in turmoil. Mm -hmm. You know, my chemicals are, I'm just in fight or flight. And then you're trying to figure out what did I do wrong to get out of it, which is just, people are sending you down these roads that are not helpful. Yeah. And it just shows to me an ignorance and a naivety of the world of mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, um, I felt the feeling of panic attacks. I I worked this one job that did not go very well and it was very stressful. And for some reason, I never had them before in my life, but I started to have, and I didn't know what was happening. All I felt, I remember the first one I had, I was sitting at like a campfire and I just sat there and was like, I'm going to die. And I just don't know. And I didn't, and I don't know why. And I couldn't stop my brain from feeling like it was, yeah, it was exactly what you said. It was like being in a snow globe and having a chain where I was like, I just, I feel like I'm going to die and I don't know what's going on and I can't do anything. And, and then eventually it passed. And I was like, Oh, that was really weird. And for several years I had them and they would just come out of nowhere. And it wasn't, wasn't fun <laughs> to say the least. Um, but for those of, uh, who are listening, who've never experienced maybe depression or anxiety, because those are, um, especially in, as I've read this more and more, it seems like, especially in our, our culture, those are like the two really big ones that seem to be prevalent um, for mental health issues in our culture is depression and anxiety. Um, so for those who don't know what they are or, or, what, it, or what they're like, um, can you just give a little description of anxiety and depression and, and what that's kind of like? Sure. I actually want to take one step back from this because something that mm -hmm. I've seen during COVID 
is that we need to distinguish the difference between mental health and mental illness before mm. we can understand where anxiety and depression fits on them. So this was something that uh, Iona Snare did during that Canadian Youth Workers Conference. And at that time, I wasn't using that language because I thought, mm. let's just like, let's just address all of it. But during COVID, yeah. every day in the news, it says, you know, we have poor mental health. And I'm like, and then someone once said to me, oh, it's incredible how much mental illness has grown. And I'm like, well, like OCD hasn't grown during COVID. Bipolar mm. hasn't, like these are, so if you think of two continuums, like two axes, mental health is one, poor mental health, good mental health. Mm. And mental health is defined by the World Health Organization, right? You're, it's, think of it as resiliency, your, your ability to function, enjoy life, work like it's a whole kind of slew and list of these things i think of it like a you know those cheap balls you get at a dollar store if you push it in yeah. it pops back out right things affect us but then we have some resiliency mm. so you can have good mental health or you can have poor mental health and every one of us has mental health just like every one of us has health mm. and usually we would think health is physical health but we each have good or poor physical health the other axis is mental illness and mental illness is defined by like defined criteria, mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, you know, bipolar, OCD, like these are defined things and you get diagnosed by someone like therapist, psychologist, social worker, right? Doctor. This is not something that we self-diagnose or those of us who are untrained to diagnose, but those two axes are really important to understand because I can be struggling with mental illness, which I have numerous defined mental illnesses, but I can have good mental health while I go through them. Mm. And it's a really profound thing to think of that you can have an illness, but also have good mental health during it. Mm. Now, looking at anxiety and depression, during COVID, we have to understand what people say. So when, when it says we have poor mental health, life really sucks right now. It does. And it depending yeah. for some people, you're two people who are still working full time uh, for others. Like my sister's a kindergarten teacher. So she's now masked with kids. Like it's, it's stressful all the time. So yeah. mental health is probably not good, which is why stats say like, you know, half of Canada has poor mental health, mm. but long-term mental health, like poor mental health can lead to mental illness. And this is where I'm concerned today. Like, the ongoing, you know, alienation and loneliness of people, you know, and then we look at um, how anxious we are about grocery shopping and all these other things and how that can yeah. turn into anxiety disorders and phobias and different things. But how it feels to me is the same. Hmm. Anxiety and depression. Now, they're both continuums, right? Doing well with anxiety to full clinical anxiety. But in the middle of that are both mental illness kind of anxiety and then regular anxiety. It's COVID right now. And so, you know, I went to church for the first time a few weeks ago and you have a little mm -hmm. bit of like, it's not clinical anxiety, but you're kind of like, hmm, even at the gym I was at today, you know, are people near you? You know, yeah. is my mask on right? You go grocery shopping at Costco and it's packed and you think through things, but none of these, like they're all in a continuum, but it's not like social anxiety or clinical anxiety or panic attacks mm -hmm. and depression is the same. We all feel blah right now, but it doesn't mean we have clinical depression. Mm. We all have loss. We've all had, like, if you have family and long-term care, lost people, like, you know, it's, it's a blah season. And then the problem to me is the situational depression in time can cause clinical depression. And so anyways, how does it feel like physiologically? Mm. Everyone's different. But for me, the biggest is um, I feel it in my chest. I feel tightness. It's like there's just hands that are just grabbing me in my heart, you know, palpitations, dizziness, which is my biggest struggle. And so you don't feel like, you know, when you, if you're on an elevator and it hits the bottom and you kind of have that yeah. second where you go, that's how I feel sometimes just watching mm. a TV show or when you're walking, you know, that cadence, you go back and forth, but you kind of yeah. think you're just going to keep going off like that kind of weirdness. Mm. heart palpitations, feeling helpless, hopeless, worthless, uh, you know, feel tingly, kind of like someone, if I rubbed your back like that, you feel tingly, yeah. but like, that's how I feel sometimes for no reason. Mm. Um, dizziness, you know, th there's a million things it could be. Depression feels like weight, like it's hard to look and feel hopeful about the future when you're trying mm. to just get through the day.
Yeah. But anxiety to me is just, this is what people often say to me afterwards. They say like, is this anxiety or is that depression? And they're kind of saying, do I have this? And I just kind of say now this, if you think you're depressed, you probably are. Mm. If you think you're anxious, you probably are. Because no one's ever walked up to me and said, is this anxiety? And then not, like, you wouldn't say to me, like, what you're saying is I have this feeling, something feels yeah. wrong, or I feel blah or depressed and it's beyond seasonal affective disorder. And as we're filming this kind of in mid-March, we're just coming out of seasonal affective disorder, right? Like yeah. time just changed for depending. Do you guys have time change in Sus? No, no, we don't. We, do, just, right? we just keep, you know, we the, just keep staying. You don't, same, okay. Yeah, we're the only ones who are just like, no, nah, we're not doing that. <laughs> You, you are the smartest province. <laughs> we need to do that. <laughs> but anyways, like with the time change, like suddenly at nighttime, it's, it's, you know, there's more light. And then within a few weeks, we'll have this like a day, even last week, we had a day that was 12 or something. And like, yeah. we all emerge outside. But this is where the situational stuff kind of goes away. And I'm looking forward to how the mm -hmm. spring and summer goes, because it's been a depressing season. But yeah, yeah there's a lot of ways we can feel with these things and it can be very different for each person yeah and you highlight something there that i think especially right now like i can just relate to it is the uh because right now it's warming up where i am like it's been this past week it's been like anywhere between five degrees to 12 degrees instead of minus 40 so it feels even just like looking outside mm -hmm. my window right now like i just feel different where it's like ah like it just i don't know why it, it's just the seasonal thing where it's like you go through winter and winter is fun for christmas i think People feel good, but it's after that Christmas <laughs> that you start to be like, okay, I'm done. And it and it gets to feel like a lot. Um, so this season's like that. And then we're obviously in this COVID season of like, uh, this is not, um, if if you were going to struggle with anxiety or not feeling the greatest or, or struggling with depression, like this would probably <laughs> reveal it a little bit where it's, it's not the funnest season at all. Um, but then even before, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, that I've heard a lot of people say that the reason why we're seeing more and more um, cases of anxiety or depression rise is because of the rise of technology. And that's been kind of given the, um, the blame for why this is happening. I'd be curious to like hear if you agree with that or if you're like, well, kind of like, what, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that um, the reason why we've seen before COVID, because now it's probably worse, uh, do you think the reason why we've seen kind of a steady incline of anxiety and depression in, in North America is because of technology or is it because of something more than that? So this is what gets blamed all the time. Mm. And so uh, is it the cause of all mental health? Hands down, no. Is it a part of the problem? Yes, it is. And this is where we need to make sure in the church we're not all or none. It's not that easy. Now, my daughter's 19, Zoe, when she was in grade one, um, the iPhone came out and like it was revolutionary. I think I stole my old phone here somewhere, but like it was revolutionary coming from this yeah. to the screen, which is everything in the world. And there have been, there's, I mean, statistics are all over the map, but the growth that I read is roughly 25 to 40% growth. And here's for the rest of the talk, I'm going to say mental health. People know what I'm talking. Like when I say that we use these words interchangeably, there's been a growth in anxiety and depression mm -hmm. more than just feeling a bit anxious, like clinical stuff has grown. Um, yeah. So technology, yes, it, it's an issue. I mean, we, we spend an extraordinary amount of time on our phones and the statistics I read talk about it, like if you and I were to spend an hour on this a day, no big deal, two hours, but there's something around that three hour mark of mm -hmm. social media and stuff. And there's these markers of people who spend three hours or more are more depressed. Now, huh. is it, is that like qualitative or quantitative? Are there other things that go along with that? Like if you're spending three hours a day on that, are there other things that you're not doing? Like, so it's not as yeah. simple as saying phone or not phone, but um, there are issues with this. So the first one I always talk about is dopamine. And so dopamine is the love drug. You know, if you give someone mm -hmm. a hug or a kiss, you get a dopamine hit, right? Chemical in the brain. Um, but I also get that every time my Apple watch taps me, mm. right? Every time, like last night I'm watching the Leafs lose to Winnipeg. And it's like, every time like <laughs> it taps me, but I get a dopamine hit to the brain. 
every time someone I post something and someone likes or something, someone comments dopamine, dopamine, mm. here's the problem. We don't know what half a million dopamine hits does to a student, but like our students are the Petri dish. You think back to chemistry, right? The little dish, like it's an experiment. And what we're yeah. seeing is that it's not good. Mm we're seeing that there's these negative things that are, are growing and especially amongst teenage girls, but there's all kinds of things that have grown in the last almost 20 years. Our diets are brutal. We eat junk all the time, right? Like yeah. we're not eating healthy. We don't sleep. And it's not just students who don't sleep. Like it's actually us as adults who don't sleep. We stay up very yeah. late. The one thing that's interesting during COVID is these protective factors that we're seeing with teenagers, more sleep, yeah, my son goes to bed at 1.30 and gets up at 10, whatever. I don't care. Like that's the normal circadian rhythm. And if there's no class on at eight, I don't care if you get up at five to 10 and turn your laptop mm. on. More time with parents and less time with social media. So there's been some interesting protective factors with students. Huh. Um, but I mean, technology is one of those things we have to make it work for us. I do have a nine part video series called How to Have a Better Relationship with Your Phone. Mm. Did you ever watch, um, what was it called? Oh, what's this? A oh, social dilemma. Yeah. Did you ever watch that? Yeah. Uh, it is a really good, uh, good series. And I would encourage you to see it. This is the fun stuff we do during COVID. My son's in the room beside me and he's loud. So I'm going to text him. I need you to be <laughs> quiet. <laughs> Quieter. Please. I love it. There. Um, okay. There's my ADHD. Oh, what are we talking about? Oh, um, uh, technology. Social dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. So social dilemma. I mean, it's, it's a little eerie with, you know, with the people like in the eerie music and stuff, but it's true. We need to have a better relationship with this. So mm. one of the first videos was on notifications and like how many times we touch our phone. So like we touch our phone in the two and a half thousand times a day, meaning like, I can't see your hands and I wonder how many times you're twirling your phone, right? This is what yeah. we do with mm -hmm. phones. Uh, you know, I turn it on an axis and I do this, like we do things. And so how do you touch it less? And how mm -hmm. do you interact less? Uh, you know, so like opening our phones 70 to 80 to hundred times a day, just looking at how do we have a better a way to do that? Like, how do we actually just get better at that? But we can't blame it all on technology, but technology is part of the issue. And there's so many other things, the pressures we put on students. I went to, uh, in Toronto uh, at our convention center, we have this thing called the university fair tour. There's a college fair tour as well. But I took my daughter a few years ago. It was palpable, just the pressure that we put on students today. Like you're in grade nine, you got to do well so you can get into, you know, the right marks for grade 12. So you can get the right college university apprenticeship. Like just, it never ends. Yeah. So there's just this slew of reasons we get into mental health uh, and then slews of reasons and ways we come out of mental health. Um, the other one we need to address, and this is my parenting talk, is that overparenting has mm. become like just, it's just the norm in how we parent. When we overfunction, our kids underfunction. Uh. And like that simplicity is when, when we bulldoze like, out of the way, all the hard things in life. They, they then head off after grade 12 when you're not there anymore. And they're not prepared. Uh, Julie Lithcott Hames says, she calls young adults today, not quite fully formed humans, yeah. which is an interesting statement when you start reading, like there's a father, this was in Leonard Sachs's book, uh, Collapse of Parenting, a father in Chicago who calls his daughter in Los Angeles. So, uh, she's at UCLA, sorry, wherever UCLA is, to wake her up and tell her what she has to do for the day. What? But if you think of what anxiety it must be as a student today, whose parents do all these things and you haven't learned the resiliency of mm. you have a fight with one of your friends and mom or dad always comes in to fix it. You haven't learned, right? Social intelligence and emotional intelligence of how to do things. And so I don't usually hear over parenting as a massive root to our struggles today, but I yeah. believe it's huge, especially in our church world today. And this is where we need to, there's a quote, like I, I talk about progression of parenting. There's a quote from a pastor named Ted Cunningham in a book, Trophy Child, where he says, they will not be with me forever. So I prepare them accordingly. Mm. It's such a simple line, but like my daughter is away at university today. She better be ready to deal with boys and sex and unfiltered internet and eating healthy and sleep. And my son in this room, 
who's more quieter now, um, he will head off to a university, probably Queens next year, and he better be ready to deal with those things as well. And mm -hmm. so it's this preparing our kids properly. And this is how I think we can decrease some of the anxiety. But there's other things, trauma. There's a lot, like there's a book. Have you ever read the book Upstream by Dan Heath? No. No. So um, Dan and Chip Heath have a lot of good books, Moments and others, but Upstream is the idea. So before we deal with all kinds of people who have porn addiction, let's have mm -hmm. good conversations on healthy sexuality. Before we deal mm -hmm. with marriages that are, people are separated and divorced, how do we go back and have good conversations on what a healthy marriage looks like? Yeah. And so trauma is a big deal today. How do we go back and stop traumas? How do we stop some of those things? Not like we can stop all of them, but how do we stop some of them? Burnout and breakdown is a big one, especially amongst leaders and pastors. And, and so how do we not have you burn out? Isolation mm -hmm. and loneliness, which has been exasperated during COVID, especially for guys, we're so isolated. Like my wife still has not as much Zoom calls, but more like she'll go for walks with people or phone calls yeah. with people. And it's like, I'm not doing that. I'll see you when no. I see. Like, it's just funny how I'd rather just put on a game and be on my own and kind of push yeah. aside. Like, but we need, we need that face to face mm -hmm. and the growth and substance abuse, which is something that's in our church, again, that we don't want to talk about, but the number of young moms who will come up to me after a talk and just say, like, I have a young kid, I'm barely hanging on, and alcohol is what's keeping me going. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I don't, I don't know who to talk to. And so there's, there's all kinds of reasons we get in that's not just technology, but technology is part of it. And amongst all those things is just predisposition as well, where we might just have a predisposition. Like people have that to cancers, to diabetes, to other things. Yeah. And some of us have that as well. And mm -hmm. I think that probably is me, meaning if I was a teacher, I probably still would have struggled with this. I don't know, but yeah. I would assume that. So my point is just anytime anyone sends you an email that says, you know, everything or always, I usually just question those words because life is not as simple as everything or always. Mm -hmm. It's something we need to question. Yeah, no, that's good. And I've, uh, yeah, I've, I've experienced that on, on, in my own, in my own way, not just with mental health, but with other things too, where it's like, uh, the polarization of culture and the like, oh, it, this is a, oh, I see it all the time with video games too, where, um, the media really loves to blame violent acts on video games. And they're like, video games is the reason why people do crazy violent things. And it's like, uh, okay. Like, I'm sure that it plays a factor in people expressing violent deeds who are, who are prone to, to, to be this way, that it probably does not help. Uh, but our video is Grand Theft Auto, the reason why people are doing crazy violent acts. That's probably a really simplistic view to look at it in the same way with technology, where it's like, um, is technology helping our mental health especially when we are on it all the time like for over three hours a day um, when I talk to people the average number that I find people are on their phones is five hours a day and I don't know what that looks like in COVID and so it's like is that healthy probably not is it the only thing is like getting outside and also like eating healthy and those and sleeping well and those also playing factors and then other things too like that over parenting piece and stuff so that's interesting um, to me of like and, and that's what I found really helpful with you is you look at mental health. It's not just like a single, there's not just like a, a silver bullet that you just need to figure this out and you'll get your life together. It's like, actually, there's like a lot of things that could be contributing to this and, and for us to kind of think about it. Um, but I just want to shift gears back to the, how this fits into the Christian life and the church life. Um, because when you talk about mental health um, and, and people going through um, these experiences, you say that, um, that mental health almost has different rules um, than other illnesses or struggles. And I, and I found this to be, uh, especially when I was listening to your talk, I found this to be like really refreshing. And so I just want to ask you, like, what do you mean that mental health has like different rules in, in society, but then also like, especially church? Like, what do you mean by that? What are the different rules that you see? So I'll give you a personal example. So when I went on medications for, for my mental illnesses. Um, I, and because I speak online, people, I ended up journeying online. So I post online and mm -hmm. say, Hey, I'm going to be starting a med this week. I'd love your prayers. I was one of those people who meds did not, 
I had reactions when I went on during it, withdrawal coming off. So I just put post, hey, love your prayers. And I would get a few hundred people writing me, our church is praying for you. You know, we love you. We're supporting you. You know, those things that you're like, okay, I'm not alone in this. Yeah. But what no one sees is the private messages. Yeah. And the dozens of people would write me and say, you're not a Christian anymore because you're taking meds. Mm. Like the devis, when you're unwell and someone writes you and says, you're not even considered a Christian anymore because you've taken medications. Yeah. So changed to uh, three, but two and a half years ago, I got diagnosed with Lyme disease. And mm. so I don't know if you know much about Lyme. Lyme is, you know, the tick, they say you got bit by a tick. I have no yeah. memory of that. They think I might've gotten bit uh, when I, li I, li I lived in the rainforest of Belize, Central America for uh, six months after high school into before my first year university. Uh, and I was bitten, I mean, I say a million times a day, but like I was bitten all the time. I mean, you literally yeah. are in the rainforest and That's they crazy. say beyond ticks could hurt you, but mm. they, they don't know if Lyme disease is the root of my struggle or if it's another journey. He, and he, my doctor mm. just said, you might just be really unlucky. So when I had to go on meds for Lyme, Posted online a couple of summers ago. Hey, I got it. I'm going on meds for Lyme. I love your prayers. Do you want to guess how many people wrote me and said I'm not a Christian anymore? Well, probably nobody. <laughs> no uh, but I found mm. that fascinating. Like it's just we have different rules for different things. How about even someone once called mental health a non casserole illness? Now, casserole is not a word we use these days, but yeah. it's a non food illness. So I go through my mental health journey. Very few people say, I'm, I'm gonna bring you dinner. A couple summers ago, I hit a patch of mud and fell off my bike and broke eight bones, like everything, hand, arm, ribs. Within hours, we're gonna bring you meals. Mm. It's just, there's different rules. And so mm. the things that people say to those of us with mental health, no one would ever say to someone with cancer, and I have multiple friends with cancer right now, no one ever would sit down and say to them, have you stopped reading your Bible? Mm. No one ever say to them, like these statements, have you not tried Jesus enough? Now, some people do. It's incredibly fringe from yeah. a cancer and other things standpoint. But the things that people say to us, and I usually use a few comics I got from Huffington Post. Like one is a guy throwing up in a toilet and the person's like, I forget. Oh, one of them's uh, a person bleeding. And it's like, you're not even trying. <laughs> like, it's like we <laughs> could think our way out of these conversations. Mm. But the point just being is, what we say to someone with cancer, with diabetes, with other illnesses and mental health needs to be the same. And the foundation is just, it's giving people the freedom to journey through what their journey is and not just give quick path answers that don't help. They actually hurt. And the, the number one thing I hear from people is the church has hurt me more than it's helped me. And if that's true, it has to stop. Yeah. And this is not, this is not an impossible thing to do. This is a very simple thing to do. It, and this is what hopefully maybe we'll talk to maybe as we wind down, how we make our church kind of a safe environment for people. But the truth is um, the different rules just have to change. If, if mm -hmm. what I say to someone with anxiety, I don't say to someone with cancer, then maybe we should check a little bit of what we're saying. Because often it's blame for mental health, but it's not mm. for other things. Yeah, that's that's interesting because um, I don't know. I think it just changes the, I don't know why, but you're right. There is these different rules and they're like subconscious for some reason where we just treat um, people going through mental health issues. It's just different where it's like, oh, it's like, it's like just a thing that you're going on in your head. Like we don't treat it like a real thing that people are going through. It's almost, especially in the church, it's often treated like something you can just, I don't know. It's, it, I, I almost think of it too, of like um, when someone goes through something hard, like a loss of, of a loved one, then it's the interesting, and I've seen it time and time again, where they're seriously grieving and it'll be like a couple months later and people will say things like, aren't you over it yet? And it's like, and the same thing with mental health, where it's often I, I've found that people kind of look at you and be like, oh, you're still struggling with it. Like, it's been 10 years, Brett. Are you, like, we're not over this yet. And it's like, no, like, it's just like, and no one would ever yeah. say that to someone with like a cancer patient. Or if you broke your leg, they'd be like, what? You're not over it yet? It's been months. What are you doing? <laughs> it's like, we just treat it differently. Um, and I think, too, uh, a lot of times people have a hard time even recognizing um 
the things that are going on with the individuals in their lives, which, which is, uh, I'm, I'm often in conversations that make me laugh because, I, and I've done this myself where you can sometimes speak ignorantly about something, not realizing that someone's experienced it in the room. And that kind of changes your perspective is when you actually know what you're looking for or, or being aware of those things. And I think that sometimes, especially in church, we aren't as aware of like the signs of people going through mental health and can often speak from a place of ignorance that's actually really damaging where um like if you if you stand on stage for example if you're a pastor and you say something that's kind of ignorant about mental health like your whole congregation anybody experiences has learned that this is not a safe place um but i think a lot of times for people who've never gone through it themselves it's hard to recognize the signs they should be looking for and we'll dive into a little bit of like um what how you can help instead of being someone who um, is maybe doing more damaging things by the things you say or how you act. But I would just want to highlight that one piece before we dive into that is like, how can we notice kind of signs of people who are struggling with this stuff? How can we kind of see um, these things going on in other people's lives um, without this, having them having to tell us? We're like, what are some of the signs we can look for? First off, I would say we need to be in people's vicinity to be able like you can't just like these are things you're going to have to talk and have a good relationship with someone to even start with mm. uh, you know it's like when you see someone hey how you doing good you good like you're that's not well i asked them and they didn't tell me they're struggling like that's not how yeah. simple it is i often find with that if i you know if i see a church I'm like hey how you doing you're like good i'm like how you really doing you know what people say it's that second time oh you should, like we begin to be honest mm. um so if you, whoever's listening, if you're looking and you're like my spouse, my kid, my parent, my whoever, how do I know? Uh, here are just some ideas. Changes in eating and sleeping patterns. Now, mm. here's the problem. These things can mean nothing. They can mean other things. So as a parent, this is the big question I get these days. Well, my kids are sleeping different. And we kind of talked about that earlier. Like our kids are going to bed later and getting up later yeah it's a normal it's called a circadian rhythm that's normal for kids i'm 49 at 10 o'clock i'm like i'm exhausted i go up and read i read fiction every night for half an hour before i go to bed mm -hmm. which is a side note don't read theology books and like like you read i was gonna say dumb stuff that's not what i mean i just like i'm reading a, a book series called the uglies the pretties the special like it's a teen series yeah which is coming to Netflix, by the way, but I read something mindless because I don't mm. want to be thinking about concepts and ideas. So anyways, change the eating sleep patterns. Number two, social isolation, withdrawal. And this is a problem is as many people are withdrawing out of fear of COVID conversations, but how do you know the difference? Like, mm. how do you want to, we know the difference of someone who's just dealing with social anxiety or someone who's actually isolating for other reasons and you don't know. And this is where we're going to have to talk to each other and ask good questions. Uh, mood changes, feeling irritable, angry, upset, frustrated, out of any word you want. Now, here's the truth. Has anyone not felt that way this week? Like yeah. it's only Monday and I've already partially this morning gone. I'm so done with this. Like I just, <laughs> I just want the world to be back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, not able to function are big ones. Can't shower, don't eat at all, um, can't get groceries. Like these are people who are now not functioning. Mm. If you went into someone's house and you, you know, you've seen this in movies and everyone's just bottles all over and there's like, you know, takeout bags from two weeks, like people who are not functioning, uh, loss of desire to do things. But I mean, don't we all feel that way? Sometimes it's just like, eh. like that's how we feel, man. Like it just, I don't, could it be? something yes is it no we don't know uh other ones uh substance abuse and we're seeing a heavy growth of i forget what the stats say last week i saw more alcohol consumption i think it was 17 percent or something more uh -huh. marijuana consumption and people are using things to try to get like i mean self-harm is hurting yourself to get beyond overwhelming feelings thoughts and emotions right mm -hmm. so people turn to alcohol turn to drugs turn to pornography to try to feel better because they're not. And in yeah. the moment, they might feel better, but it's not fixing things. Um, the biggest sign, though, is the scariest one, because the biggest sign is no sign. Uh, I mean, if, if I'm on a Zoom call today with 50 people, I can't go, okay, row two, number three, you, okay, you, like, you can't do that. 
Now, yeah. there are people you know. I mean, often when we think of mental health, it's the person you see on the news, right? They come out of a store with a knife or something and it's and they're just unwell. You know that. A lot of the homeless population, we have a lot of mental illness dealing with that. But this is not like the average person. I can't just look at each of you and say, you're, you're struggling. Sometimes, mm. I think those of us who, who do struggle, we see signs like... Yeah. Uh, like for me, even now, when I get anxious, I move, like, like I sit up or I lean back. If I feel dizzy, there's things, or I might tap my knee, like, mm. but usually you don't know. And this is the problem is we need to have friends who know us and to be known and known could be a sexual conversation. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying rich friendships where you can say, how are you? And someone can say, I'm having yeah. a really rough week. And this is the stuff that we're missing to me is the rich the rich friendships. And this is what we need to make sure we're getting even during COVID. Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting point um, with the, the deep friendships and actually knowing people, not just having the surface level relationships. And I know that for me, especially, it's very easy for me to have superficial, like very surface level relationships where it's like, I have a lot of acquaintances, but I don't have like a lot of friends where we actually hmm. like, dive deep into the real things. And I found that the, the best parts of my mental health journey are when I've had those close friends that I can go to and talk to about anything. But the thing is that like, to get to that place with someone, it takes a lot of work. So it's not something you can just, and our culture is so fast that we don't give ourselves enough time. And even right now, it's like, what do you do in COVID? Where it's like, let's have a Zoom call for three hours so we can get to know each other better. It's like, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound like the most fun thing to me. Um, but just to realize that those things are really important for you to know people, but then also for you to be known by, by people. And it's, I think it's something that, I don't know, for me personally, I've often, um, like when I first started working at the church that I currently work at, it's just like, I'm so busy. I don't have time. And I, I, you just keep moving and don't realize that you haven't really made any deep relationships you can be honest with. And, and that eventually, I feel like you're right that like that catches up to you. Not only are you not there to help others where, because I don't, not very many people are going to walk up to you and be like, Hey, I'm really struggling with mental health today, even though I don't really know you. Like it's, it's usually a vulnerable thing. And same thing for, for you, if you're going through it, it's, it's hard to know who to trust with that. And it's just like, it's a vulnerable thing to do. And so to have those kinds of relationships where, where you can um, have that kind of honesty with each other. Um, and so for those I of think, us who, yeah. I was gonna say, I think we need, so in my, my talk on men, I have this rubric of eight things, like mental health, physical, spiritual health, men as fathers, men as husbands, sex, finances, loneliness, like I have this thing. But I tell people to stack, and I, it's not mm -hmm. a term, I'm just saying stacking meaning, so we don't have time for stuff. So why don't you combine your exercise with a friendship? So go for a walk mm -hmm. with someone. Like, I don't care where you live right now, you can go for a walk even during lockdowns. So I've been having meetings. I live near a lake, but we, we have meetings by the lake. We meet, come in two different cars, coffees or no coffees are relevant. And you go for an hour walk. Uh, uh, you know, I'm married. So my wife and I try to walk together. There's something about walking. You can talk, you're outside, there's sun, there's community, you're, you're with mm -hmm. someone, you're getting vitamin D. Like there's all these great things. And so that to me is a great environment that we can do during COVID for sure. And I, I think we should do it even after COVID's done. Walking yeah. is just a great thing. No, and that's a good point because um, I don't know, you just get in the rut of not doing it that it can feel, I know for me, like oftentimes I'm like, I don't even know what to do. Or it's like, am I just supposed to be like, hey, or we're just going to meet and have coffee, but to be like, hey, do you want to do X? And then to let that, especially I've, I've noticed too, because I'm, uh, I, I'm a youth pastor, so I've noticed that when it comes to guys in particular with youth, that often the bonds come from doing something together, not just like sitting in a room and talking, that actually the, the doing stuff together leads them to sitting in the room and talking, mm -hmm. which I find is an interesting, and I don't know what it is, I don't know why, and it's not like it happens every time, and every, it's not like you can put every guy or girl in a box, but for some reason, especially with guys, I find that there's this thing where it's like, you need to do something in order to, to actually, yeah. So I think, yeah, that's, especially in COVID, because it's like, what, are you going to Zoom call everybody? Probably not, because that's not, I think everyone's kind of done with it. <laughs> yeah, so for finding sure. those ways to, to stack, I think that's huge. Um, so for those of us who 
maybe know someone who's going through this um, or, or is struggling in this area, or maybe even just for future reference, if someone we find out is struggling with anxiety or depression or, or whatever, what, what should we do? Because obviously um, the Job's friend's response isn't the greatest. Um, and, and, and we, especially as Christians and as the church have struggled with knowing how to respond to these things well, um, so what would you recommend for, for those of us who know people um, or who will know people going through these things? What, what should we do when we encounter this? How can we actually be helpful instead of harmful? Well, it's the same for you if you struggle. Um, mm. I See, there's the moment when you're struggling. Like, I, I'm not having a great day. I'm anxious. It's just, it's a bad day. But you learn your own coping strategies, right? Like if I was speaking at your church tonight, I'd be sitting in a chair and different things. But I, I believe I'm very pragmatic. I want a system. And so I think what we need to view this as, whether it's someone you love, someone in your congregation, youth group, or you is, we view the world body, mind, and soul. Your issue now, some people divide that up, body, mind, soul, and relationships or other things. I like body, mind, soul, because it's the acronym I've heard throughout my life. So body, eat better, sleep more, exercise daily, go see a family doctor, get blood work done. Like I had blood work mm -hmm. done this week. I also believe in functional medicine. So it's integrative medicine, it's called. So it's doctors and naturopaths who work together and physiotherapists and massage therapists and osteopaths mm -hmm. and people who talk about your guts and your brain, like it's all of that together. But like, if you're not sleeping, go see a sleep specialist and go get a sleep clinic done. Mm -hmm. Like your issue might be physical. So, and whether or not, what's the book I'd like to promote? Uh, this is called uh, the ripple effect. Yeah. Sleep, eat, move, think like not a faith-based book, but like, if you're not sleeping well, why don't we start with that? <laughs> Yeah. Like, why would we immediately head to a, I'll pray for you, which is still good, but why wouldn't we give practical ways of how to sleep better? I think mm -hmm. we, we don't know what to say, but like, those are foundations of life. And so I like that. So a hey, body, do anything you can do with the body. And I'm not saying you exercise for a week or you eat well for a week. I'm saying if you're unwell right now, you might have to cut out aspartame. Sleep is the foundation of everything. Like I have a YouTube video of 20 ways to have better sleep, like blackout blinds and turning your TV off or any phones and tech an hour before bed. Like there's just simple mm. things that we can do. Like I'm an iced coffee guy. It's my second of the day. Uh, but if I'm like, and even today I'm a bit anxious. The question is, is, is caffeine affecting me? And tomorrow I'll probably go down mm. to one coffee. It's not that that will fix it or be the answer, but like if you're already anxious caffeine just and same with aspartame and it kind of exasperates what's already going on so a yeah. body b um go see a counselor and i'm talking a registered counselor not a friend like even though there's like people to talk to but a registered therapist counselor mm -hmm. and get some strategies to help you you know my counselors always kind of took all the different thoughts and put them together and so I, I like that strategies for what to do. So your issue might be physical. It might be emotional. So there's body, mind. Now, language is always important. And so before I say your issue might be spiritual, I don't say that because it's unbelievably uncommon that your answer to mental health is just spiritual. But, and this is a big but, God says you'll have trouble in this world, but he says, I'll be with you in the trouble. So mm. our faith and our foundations of faith, like, like those spiritual disciplines and practices we do are so important because that's, our, no matter what you're going through in life, we journey through that with our spiritual disciplines. Now, you journey through that, whether you get better or not, because we're not guaranteed to get better. It's not like mm. I'm a Christian. And so like, it's not the idea, like I'm, I'm now eight and a half years into a journey. It's not like, like, because I know Jesus, I will be better. Yeah, I hope I'll be better. At eight years, I don't know if this will be something I manage for the rest of my life. Maybe. Like, I'm not speaking that over myself, as someone might say. I'm just saying eight years in, 58 practitioners later, like, I'm still seeing people. I'm still journeying. But anyways, yeah. my point is body, mind, and soul is the way to view this. Our faith is mm -hmm. what we journey through this with, but the issues most often are looking at you know, trauma, looking at our past from a, a, a counseling standpoint or giving us strategies, but often it's the physicality component. You can't work 90 hours a week 
and not have something break your body, mm -hmm. your mind, your soul, your relationships, your family, like your marriage, the list goes on. So I love that because you don't know what someone's going through. So I can't tell you what's wrong with you. Yeah. But I'll give you the, here's a great example. Uh, a friend of mine in Alberta at a church that's uh, mental health is not body, mind, and soul. Mental health is soul. That's it. Mm. So not the same time as me, but like I was at home, went to sleep clinics. I went to my, um, one, uh, each of them, I would always say to the doctor, can you fix me? And every time they said no. And every time I think I looked down kind of like discouraged. And one of my yeah. doctors once said, no, he said, look up, look at me. He said, this is good. You don't want sleep issues. Like he says, you have fragmented sleep. So he said, it's beyond my scope. Uh, mm. But this guy, I challenged his church would just pray for him. And again, I'm an and, I'm not an or person, right? I think that's an important language. Yeah. Like it's body, mind, and soul. It's not like this. It's not like I say it's eating healthy or Jesus. It's not like I have to yeah. throw one of them out. It's an and. But his church was an or. It was only. It couldn't be this and this. So the only answer was prayer. And so they were praying. And after a while, I just said, keep praying. But can you go to a sleep clinic? And he mm -hmm. did. And he was told he had the worst sleep apnea that that doctor had ever seen. Wow. And they put him on, I call them Darth Vader machines, the BiPAP CPAP <laughs> machines. And he was better almost instantly. Mm -hmm. And again, the issue was that. Like, mm -hmm. if your issue is low vitamin D, if your issue is your thyroid gland, if your issue is something, why don't we look at that? Like, if your issue is exhaustion and you're burning out and other things, let's deal with that. And that's what's what I just love body, mind, and soul. I just think it's a great, simple way to view this conversation. And these roads are ones you journey all together at the same time. Yeah. And that's good. And I think um, for me, that's been super helpful. And that's the one thing that I found super helpful in this time. Like I said, at the beginning is when I watched your talk on this, um, uh, preparing for this to realize the, um, and be reminded that my mental health journey isn't just, and either or it's not just getting up praying reading my bible it's also like did i sleep eight hours the night before mm -hmm. or did i stay up till 2 a.m and now i'm waking up at seven um am i eating a large pizza every day that's probably not going to help am i exercising um am i am i going and seeing a doctor am i going and seeing a counselor which i would say to those of you who have never seen a counselor even if you feel like you're not struggling with anything let me tell you i used to think that you'd just go to a counselor because you couldn't figure out, I don't know, your problems on your own. So you need to talk to someone else. But it's like, I don't, even when I don't have something wrong, going to my counselor and actually just like sitting down and talking, and he has a way of like pulling stuff out of me that I don't even know is there. It is one of the most helpful things I've ever done for my mental health, but also just the way I live my life. It's, I would, couldn't recommend it enough, but I think that that's, that's so interesting and helpful to think it's not a, it's not an either or it's it's an and and it's all of those all those things combined um and so i just wanted to ask you as we are starting to wrap up here um before we close um when when you were going through this and when and as you're still going through this what are some of the things that you needed from people like what were some of the the things that you either wish people did or that things that people did do that were really helpful for you as you went on this journey? Listen to me, sit with me. And I might even say lament with me, if we can use that terminology. Mm -hmm. I remember once I was at church, it was my first, one of my first times back to church after many, many months. And I went into my gym and one of my pastors started coming over because I was kind of praying, oh God, let no one see me. Like I'm just in the corner. And he came over and I'm kind of like, oh no. And he sat down, kind of slumped down against the wall where I was sitting. And he said nothing. Just looked around for a second. And then he said, this really sucks, doesn't it? And I'm like, yeah. And we sat for a bit. I think he just kind of patted my knee and off he went. And I'm just like, interesting. Mm. Right? There's just something about the simplicity of that, that I like, but like, be there, ask questions. How are you doing? Right. We don't need to just give answers. How are you feeling? Talk mm. about other things. Talk about, for me, talk about Raptors and Leafs. I'm in Toronto. Like talk about the things that like, I don't need everything to be about me, but I'd like something to be about me. And I still have people in my life who've never really talked or asked questions about my journey. Mm. 
And so it's, it's just this middle, it's just feeling that I'm being heard and not just looked over because kind of like in the book of Job, like I kind of feel, you know, Job's family, we never talk about Job's family. I mean, and the wind came and the house fell and Job's family died. I always just say like, I feel like Job's kids, like I feel just forgotten sometimes, like the world just keeps moving on and you still, like I still eight years later and living in my head and journeying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no right answer, but say something. I always say, mm -hmm. just say anything. Like it, it, there's no wrong thing to say, but if your choices don't say anything to me or say something that's wrong, say what, like just at least you're there. And then say afterwards, yeah. was that an okay thing to say? Or what do you need from me? Mm -hmm. I, I challenge people not to say, hey, let me know if you want to go for a burger or let me know if you want to go for a coffee. Say to mm -hmm. someone, I want to take you for a coffee. What day works for you? Don't put it back on the unwell person to have to then figure out and write you back about when you're free. Like, yeah. or, Hey, if, if you want a lasagna, let me know, just bring them a lasagna. Just say, I'm going to, I'm bringing over food. Tell me what day works for you. Mm. But there's no perfect answer with that, but it's just the, it stops. I would also say, stop saying things that are cliche, like stop saying simple lines. Like, it, well, everything's going to be good because it says so in Romans. And it's like, oh, yeah. tell that to the, the family. Like, this is things we get all the time. And again, yeah, different yeah. things. Because you would never say to some mom who's had a miscarriage, everything's going to be good. You'd never say to someone who's just lost a family member to cancer, everything will be good. But we say to people with mental health, it will all be good. Kind of like at some moment, everything will just be fine. And it's just not yeah. true. It might be. I always use, uh, there's a great book by um, Richard Winter calls, called When Life Goes Dark. And he says there's five reasons we suffer. And I've always really appreciated this. Number one is Genesis 3. That we live in a fallen world and we're deeply affected by it. That I have a fallen body. And most likely, whether for me it's the trauma of a burnout or a breakdown, or for me I have something that's just wrong. Like, yeah. I like the Genesis 3. Uh, number two, we live with the effects of others' sins. One of my best friends was killed by a drunk driver about 17 mm -hmm. years ago. Someone else made a choice to do something, and we all live with that. Yeah, um, Our own sinful nature, and I worked too hard for too long. And people will find that, like, the older we get, how old are you, by the way? I'm 23. Like, there's something about your 20s that you can push and push hard. Mm -hmm. And for a guy my age, I can't. Like, I think I still have this, this level I can get to. And for some reason I can't, I can do it differently, but I can't, but mm -hmm. I thought I'd be fine. And I was wrong. Um, and the, the last two are things we're not great at. One is Ephesians 6, 12. And so I'm very careful to say that because someone says, are you saying everything spiritual? And it's like, well, no, but that's also in the Bible. So how do we have mm -hmm. this balance that there is a spiritual realm? Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker, is a very good uh, basic conversation on this that we have to, and I would just say, please don't go here first. Like mm. the number of 15-year-old girls who tell me my mom says I'm demonized and I'm like, what? And it's like, because they're journeying with something. Again, no one would ever mm. say that with someone with cancer, yeah. but they do for us. And lastly, is God's discipline discipleship. And there's verses in the Bible that I don't fully understand. Mm. It's good for me to be afflicted so that I might know your decrees. You know, God tests his people and his prophets to know what's in their heart. Mm -hmm. There's a book I would encourage anyone in leadership to read. It's uh, Mental Health in the Church by Stephen Grekovich. Mm -hmm. And he has a quote. I'm going to read this because I want to get it right. He says, herein lies one of the most pervasive misunderstandings regarding mental illness, that God spares this kind of pain and suffering from those with deep and abiding faith. Mm -hmm. It is like... It, that thought that, you know, Christians won't deal with this kind of thing is so devastating to those of us who actually journey with it. Yeah. And when there's a naivety and a non-understanding of what mental health is, we, we, we lose this idea of how do you as a youth pastor connect with a kid with social anxiety who won't come out. Or on a Sunday morning service, how someone might not be able to connect with small groups or big church, or the loud music sets them off. Like when we don't understand that, we're missing a way to connect people to God, which is kind of the idea of what we're doing inside church. Mm -hmm.
And so I, I think it's a really great book for people. Uh, and I've, I have a book list I, uh, on Amazon where every book on every topic that I speak on is actually listed. And you can add that oh, in wow. the show notes or whatever later. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, <laughs> Brett, last question for you. And you kind of you kind of hinted at it there. Um, so as we look at this and, and we're thinking about this uh, mental health in the church, um, obviously, we as the church have gotten it wrong a lot and have done a lot of damage. So what would you, what would you recommend for us as, as people who are in churches or maybe people who are leading churches? Um, how can we make the church a place that is, is better for those who are struggling with mental health? Or it's more of a safe place for those who are struggling. Do you know what? I wish that every church would ask that question. Mm. Right. It's, it's this most, because what you're actually saying is here's everything we have. Mm. What, what needs to be changed? Like we hold our structures so close. Um, yeah. So here's kind of four thoughts on that. The first is address mental health mm. and address it from the pulpit. Mm. Like too often, like I'll be speaking to a, a, as I say, a room full or a zoom full of youth pastors and it's like, you can't just have, like, mental health has to be the thing that the church looks at, not just we talk about it in youth ministry in one way, mm -hmm. and they go home to a parent who tells them, well, you, you, you've stopped reading your Bible. Yeah. Or they go into a Sunday morning service, and anxiety and depression, like, even yesterday morning, I was listening to someone, and I turned them off, because right in the very beginning was just, and if you have anxiety and depression, it was just this one liner of just, if you only did that, it would be gone. And I'm like, uh. talk about just cutting off half of the audience who deals with these things mm. by a statement that had nothing to do with even the sermon, but mm. address it from the pulpit and address it in the right way. Meaning like that quote from Stephen Grekovich, not that God is like, not that God spares the people in the audience who aren't strong Christians, but we live in a fallen world and we love our people. How do we help you better? Mm. Number two, educate yourself as a leader and educate your other leaders and volunteer lay leaders. Like mental health first aid, I think everyone should take it. Um, Living Works has a number of different programs and there's kind of a whole slew of them, but they go from pretty basic. There's a new one for faith as well, all the way up to what to do with like suicide intervention. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is as a pastor, whether youth, young adult, children's parent, like for whatever reason, people feel very, open talking to let's use the word clergy about their mental health and mm. so we should know what to do mm. and we may be called on for things uh like when there's been a suicide when there's been something that's happened like or other things how do we respond to that yeah. um another one um sanctuary mental health is one i'm going through i think they're out of bc and i'm i'm just walking through it but i've done enough that i think i could say it's pretty good they have I think it's a 10 week small group program. So mm -hmm. A, we're addressing it. B, we're educating ourselves. Mm -hmm. C, and this is the hardest one and the one I get the most pushback. And this is where we hold onto our structures for dear life. Walk through your church from the parking lot all the way through, through the eyes of someone who's struggling. Mm -hmm. And so what are unnecessary barriers that we can change? So the one that has always bothered me is ropes. Now, mm. this means a little different because during COVID, as our churches open up, we will have things roped on and off. Yeah. But let me think of pre-COVID. So I'm at a church, I'm speaking on mental health, and the person said, oh, we roped off all the sides and we want to get everyone in the middle. And the guy said, um, are you okay with that? I took a big breath and I said, is it my choice? And the guy said, yes. He said, can you, and I just said, can you remove them? Mm. And he said, why? As he says, why? A woman's going by putting her coat on, not off. Like we're half an hour before starting. And she stops and says, sorry, are the ropes moving? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm going to stay. Mm. And the pastor turned to her and said, why? Like, and she said, I was leaving because of the ropes. Mm. I struggle with mental health. I sit there. That's where I want to sit. And you've roped it off. And I just say to pastors, I don't care where you sit. I don't care if you want the balcony. If you, I'd rather a teenager come to youth, but sit in that corner on his own than not come at all. Like, how yeah. do we just take that unnecessary barrier away? Now, mm -hmm. through COVID, we are going to have to rope off things because we can't have people together. But yeah. 
we can have a conversation with all the ushers, greeters, whoever, where if someone says, can I sit there? It's not an arrogant statement of that's where they sit, but it's a, I need to be on an end because if I'm not on an end, an end of the church, I'm not coming in. Mm. And so there's nothing like, it's just acknowledging and not like for someone, if they have to like fight to get a seat at the end, or what they might do is just accept their seat and then get up and leave a few minutes later, just, just so unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the second one in this is um, worship leaders and worship directors. My challenge is to do, as the name says, to lead and direct. Hmm. Um, I would encourage worship leaders to never say everyone rise. Hmm. It's the most simple line, but the moment you ask me to rise, I can't worship anymore. Huh. And so, because if I have to stand and I'm dizzy, like on a day like today, I can sit, but if I have to stand, all I'm going to do is to hold on to the pew in front of me for dear life. And I'm an ethical firstborn. So if you tell me to rise, I will rise. Mm. Uh, but even when I just sit, people kind of look at you like there's something wrong with you that I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah. You can worship standing. You can worship sitting. Let's take the anxiety and depressed people like disorders out of the picture. How about the the mother who was breastfeeding three times throughout the night, who is just exhausted. Mm, yeah. How about the guy who just had a hip cert? Like, how about anyone in your audience? So here's all I say to people, stand or sit, whether you raise your hands or not, like whether you stand or sit, just welcome them in. And don't say statements that lead people down a dark path. Mm. Everyone ready to worship? My answer often would be no. Like, <laughs> but why are you lead? Like, you know, yeah. are you ready to worship? Did everyone have a great week? Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Like these are sentences we use and it's not like wrong. Yeah. But for someone who's unwell, they're already disconnected to God. We, we, we don't mm. like, I always say like mental health is kind of like a brick wall between you and God. Mm. We talk about an emotional feeling, but when we're, we have our deadened emotions and heightened emotions all at the same time, we feel disconnected. Don't lead people down that place. I heard someone once say, whether you stand or sit, whether you're glad to be here or not, we're glad you're here. And mm. I, I felt just teary because it's like, I can be in this place, right? Yeah. Um, and the last one in this kind of part three would be the loudness of music. Now, this is where I don't think we need to change and just do acoustic guitar, acoustic guitar in like every church. But some churches are really loud. Mine yeah. is and others are. And that's okay. But for the people like fight or flight, now fight, fight or flees. If you're already anxious and you already feel tingly, booming speakers with lasers or smoke for some churches, but even just loud music affects you. So mm. I'm at a church. Um, uh, where was I? I've been in a few, uh, Alberta and one in British Columbia. And there were two things they had. One was they had a bucket of earplugs, kind of like you're heading into a movie or a concert hall, but it's just like, we know it's loud. Here you go. And one of the churches I was at actually said, we know we have loud music. If this affects you, if it's too much for you, we have out back, um, I think, I forget how many couches, like a dozen couches, and there's a flat screen TV, and there's quieter music. And if you want to go worship out there, you're welcome to. And then he said a line I'll never forget. And please don't think you're disturbing me when you come back in. Mm -hmm. You know what it was? Permission. Yeah. Permission, right? I know you struggle. I know it's loud. Please go enjoy it. And if you come back in, do not worry that you're disturbing me. Like, again, I just almost cried because it's like, thank you. Like, what a mm. simple line for anyone in that audience, even if they stay to go, this is a good place for me. Like, I'm safe yeah. here. And the last thing I would say is to resource your congregation, everyone. And so I had one church. So I came early. I set up it was like a large kind of half moon foyer. I set up my booth and I rushed in to speak. When I left, I came out the other side and I didn't see this. It wasn't just like a table set up. It was this, it was wood on top. And it said something like, what was the line? Like we care or some, something about caring. And I kind of walked over and on it was anything for anyone who struggles with not just mental health, but a lot of things in their community. Mm. They had a book of the month out and if you wanted to buy a copy, they had a box out back. Uh, it had counselors, like local counselors, guys and girls mm. from all kinds of different counseling agencies. And you could take a card. They had pamphlets for parents 
and for people who struggle on everything from eating disorders to mental health to all these things, you know, those kind of like, you know, there's slots that I'll go up. Yeah. And then beside that was everything that that community, not that church community, that community offered. So that church offered celebrate recovery, which is a really good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Other churches offered like freedom sessions, which is a growing thing across the country. I think that comes from village uh, where Mark yeah. is. Um, other churches offered like that sanctuary mental health. And then there was, but the list like divorce care is held at the Baptist church down the road. You know, um, AA is held at the community center and they just listed mm -hmm. off. There was literally everything. And you know what that says? This is a safe place for you to come and love Jesus and struggle with what you're struggling with. And it was just so moving so the question mm -hmm. is, is how do you make your church a safe place for people who journey? Now, we haven't even talked about people, you know, with special needs, yeah. right? Or other, like, that's another whole conversation. I have a friend who has a couple daughters with, with a lot of special needs, and, like, they may call out in a service and stuff. And how do we either, like, mm -hmm. how do we deal with that? What do we do as a church body? Yeah. But if we're just doing what we've always done, like... If people across the board say the church has hurt me more than it's helped me, we are holding on to things that are hurting people. We got to mm. release them. Yeah. And these are not these, like asking a worship leader to, to say whether you stand or sit. Is that really like, is that a theological thing that we're going to argue? We shouldn't like, it's so simple, mm -hmm. but again, it's looking at the church from, a, 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 from an auspice of mental health and saying, how can we be better? And we can, and I'm seeing churches get better. Brett, that is so good. And this whole conversation has been great. I know for a lot of people, this is going to be refreshing or enlightening um, or challenging to, to us and, and, and how we face these things as a church and even how we face them personally. Um, I know it's going to help a ton of people. For those who want to dive deeper and want to, and want to learn more, where can they go to like get some of these books or, or just dive a little bit deeper with some of your content. Um, where can they go for that? Sure. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to, I have a new book that came out called parenting, navigating everything. Now you can't read everything here. This isn't a normal book. Um, this is a 226,000 word handbook hmm. First six chapters on parenting last 10 chapters, everything from family discipleship, sex, porn, all those things, loneliness, substance abuse, finances, education, but the largest chapter by far, mental health. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the last 10 chapters that anyone can read it. It's not, the first six chapters are on parenting, communication, discipline, progression of parenting, but the last 10 are written for anyone. So you could, you know, if you have a 15 year old kid at home, they could read it. Like my kids mm -hmm. could read that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where I, like, that's my most current mental health conversation my website's just my name brettallman.com and from that it's if you click on blog i have every topic i speak on and i'm more of a curator michael hyatt years ago called this a landing place so like mm -hmm. i probably have a thousand articles blogs but most of them aren't mine often it's like hey like last uh when did I, I think it was last friday i posted something on doom scrolling well, it's not my article. It was Gospel Coalition. Here's a great article. Boom, it's tagged mm -hmm. in the media section. Um, I do have an Amazon page. It's amazon.ca slash shop slash Brett Allman, but I'll, I'll send that to you for the show notes as well. But this is, and I don't like the term, but it's an Amazon influencer program, but it means every category I speak on. So if you clicked on mental health, it's every book directly linked for you. Uh, and uh, it just makes everything so simple. Uh, it, it's yeah. all there. So if, this is, if you're saying, oh, what's a great book on parenting? Or you're here, we're talking about mental health. And you're like, well, he mentioned pornography. I think this is an issue. All my my favorite books that are all there are there. Awesome. And on the breadalman.com, all my social media is at the top. And the one thing I encourage people to do is, is to, and this is kind of the combating the social dilemma movie. What do we do? I want my social, like, so when I finish this, like talking's exhausting, right? For any of us to talk. And so yeah. I'll most likely go and turn my iPad on and mindlessly do whatever. But if I mm. hop on Facebook, I don't just want someone's dinner and someone's dog. Yeah. I want rich content from preachers, yeah. from leaders, from teachers, from specialists and all these places. I just, I want that. So all my social media is at the top. And what I usually do is I follow everyone on everything. So mm. that no matter what platform I'm on, I get some really, really great content. 
Mm-hmm. And I'll say as a side plug, I still speak for a living and whether physical or digital, uh, if you could ever use me for something, uh, please just uh, find me online and let me know. I'd love to do that. Uh, Brett, this has been so good. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being on. Um, it's been a ton of fun. Uh, I've definitely enjoyed it. And thank you for, for being someone who's willing to talk about this and, and to help us as Christians figure it out and do it a bit better. Seriously, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. I, To me, this is one, such an important conversation. And I love the chance just to sit today and over a bit of time, get a chance to walk through it. And if, any, if anyone has any questions, again, you can find me online as well.